Welcome to Win Wednesdays. Before we begin, we want to remind you that the session will be recorded and following the session, the recording will be available to you at our website, www.acceleratingwin.org. And throughout the session, as questions come to mind, please use the Q&A function in Zoom to share your questions with us. The Women in Industry program is an initiative of the Roland School of Business at Point Park University. And it's focused on, whoops, <laughs> jumping ahead of myself. It's focused on educating and empowering, accelerating the success of women identified students and professionals and engaging leaders, affecting conversations and encouraging allyship through elevating experiences. And we have several different initiatives under the Women in Industry umbrella. Uh, one is, of course, the Win Wednesdays virtual speaker series that you're participating in right now. Uh, we also have a Win Campus speaker series uh, when conditions allow for that on campus. And our Accelerating Women in Industry annual event that coincides with International Women's Day. So that will be coming up on March 5th, 2021. And we encourage you to support our efforts uh, and sponsor one of our winning programs or contribute to the initiative and more information can be found at our website or through the Roland School of Business website. I'm Doreen Saletti, and I'm an Associate Professor of Marketing and Sales at the Roland School of Business, working with my colleague, Sandy Mervosh, who is uh, an Assistant Professor and Program Director for Human Resources Management and Program Director of our Women in Industry program. So I'm going to turn it over to Sandy to introduce today's guest. Thank you, Doreen. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce to you today, Shannon Gregg. She is the president of Cloud Adoption Solutions. She is, it is a woman-owned Salesforce consultancy focused on change management and user adoption. Shannon is an aficionado of sales technology to increase efficiency in the sales process, early adopter and adoption influencer for sales technology systems, particularly the salesforce.com technology and technology that integrates with the Salesforce platform. She is a self sales productivity expert, sales tech geek, sales operation fanatic, and Salesforce obsessed. So Shannon, thank you very much for joining us today and sharing with us uh, the power of selling. Amazing. Thank you, ladies. And thank you so much to the Roland School of Business for making this possible. I am so pumped to be here with you all today. Really excited to talk about the power of selling because let's face it, we're all in sales. Whether or not you identify yourself with a title that says, yes, I'm in sales, or you're in a completely different field altogether, everybody's in sales. So one of the things that I want you to get yourself in the mindset for today is that as we think about how we are salespeople in different aspects in our lives, I'm going to give you some tips and tricks today that you can immediately apply to those situations, whether you're in professional sales or you're just trying to sell your idea, a place you want to go out to eat with your friends and family, or a new way to attack folding the laundry at home. So we're all in sales. So let's talk about that today. On the next slide, I am going to tell you, you're in sales even if you're not. So imagine with me, if you will, and if you want to close your eyes, you can, because you're at home and I can't see you. Imagine with me that it is one year from today and it's November 4th, 2021. And you're sitting just a little bit taller. Your, your clothes feel a little bit softer. You feel a little bit more confident about the skills that you bring to the table because you've spent the last 365 days using some of the tips and techniques that I've given you today to understand whenever you're in a situation where you want to exchange value, that sales is your friend. So even if you're not in sales, I want you to think a little bit today like a salesperson. So that scenario that you just had in your mind of yourself sitting tall and strong and feeling good, that's exactly what I want you to carry with you through the next few minutes while we're together talking about 
how you're going to apply these techniques. So some of the things I'm going to ask you to type into the Q&A box. So to find that, if you just sort of hover over at the bottom of your screen on the Zoom navigation bar, you will see uh, what looks like two little communication bubbles with Q&A underneath it. You can place those things inside of there. And if you come up with any other questions during the session, throw those in there too, because our dear friends at Media Services are gonna make sure that we can get those questions answered during this session. So on the next slide, I just wanna tell you a little bit about how in the world I ended up in sales <laughs> because a lot of us just don't plan it. You know, uh, Dr. Sledding and I have had a lot of conversations about how people move into professional sales and how there is a real movement now in the United States that recognizes the U.S. Census will tell you one in nine people identify themselves as being in sales. That can vary from retail sales to professional sales and sort of everywhere in between. But one of the things that's interesting to me always is to learn how do people get into sales? What drove you into sales? I personally myself have a bachelor's degree in English literature, <laughs> which just screams, jump into sales, lady. Well, I started writing proposals and I was working on a proposal team. And then I realized sales was just a process. Sales wasn't something that I thought it was a long time ago. And I, if I ask you right now to just close your eyes a little bit again and think of a salesperson, I bet your salesperson has a gray suit on that probably is shiny and if you touched it, your hands would repel against it a little bit. And that person probably works in an automobile lot, right? So many people have that concept. This is what a salesperson is. A salesperson is somebody that's trying to take something away from me without me getting the value that I wanted for that exchange, okay? So a lot of people think of salespeople like that. And I am here to tell you, that is not what most salespeople represent. And so I wanna give you some of the tips and tricks that will help you not only to shift your mindset, but also help you apply these to your everyday approach in life. So I moved into my first sales role. I was actually selling software in the nuclear non-proliferation space, <laughs> which is not the first place many people start their sales careers, but here you have it. And while I was doing that, I found that the best way to approach people was through the three sort of techniques I'm going to give you today. One, understanding how to build relationships because sales are much more than transactions. And most people who find themselves in professional sales positions or needing these sales skills, regardless of the profession that they're in, will understand that they have to build these relationships. The next thing we'll talk about today is data. How you can use data to drive both the buyer's journey and the seller's journey. And then finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about how you can present with power because that's where so much of sales starts. So um, I've got a couple of pictures of me here <laughs> uh, for selling, how I found myself into selling. But the most important picture that I've got on this slide all the way to the end is my eight-year-old who has a natural and innate ability to sell as do all children. So if you think of a child that you have in your life, I bet if they've asked you for dessert and you've said you cannot have dessert until you finish your whole entire meal, including those veggies, child, those children have come back and probably said to you, but why not? What's the reason why? Can you help me understand a little bit more? I really want it. And so a lot of those sort of concepts of selling, they're innate. We already have them inside of us. And so today I hope to help you unlock them just a little bit so that we can get to a place where you can use some of these tools and techniques in a way that is very organic, very honest, and very focused on you. So we're ready for the next slide, which is where we're going to talk about relationships. So one of the things that I want you to pay attention to today and for the rest of the week, so just a couple of days, is how many times the people you interact with use the word I. Look at your emails, listen to the voicemails that you get, and look at those interactions to say, how many times have these people used the word I? Because as soon as you use the word I as a salesperson, that says, I'm me focused. I care about me. I have something to get to, maybe my quota, maybe something that uh, my sales manager told me I needed to get to, and I need something, and so I'm leading with I. 
And that sort of focus, it's not good in people relationships and it's definitely not good in selling relationships. So one of the first things I want you to do is start to notice the number of times people say the word I. I watched a really persuasive talk recently with Tony Robbins and I know that you all know who Tony Robbins is. He stands up on stages and talks to football stadiums worth of people and he says the word I so many times that once you start listening for this sort of thing, it will make the little hairs on the back of your neck stand up. Because when you're talking about exchanging value, which is really what marketing and sales are, we're looking for a value exchange. As soon as you introduce I, that's a really selfish motivation. And so if you are trying to sell something to somebody, your candidacy for a job, your um, product or service that your company has, or you're taking on a brand new project in a different role so that you can understand how finance and operations plan for operational resource planning for the next year. The thing that you're trying to sell conceptually product or service based it has to be driven by understanding what is the value that we're trying to exchange here. And that's where the relationships come in. And one of the things that I know, and I think so many people have been starting to see, there's a lot of primary and secondary research out there that's showing women are amazing at sales. Women are amazing at sales. Now, we've got a problem. A lot of women don't self-select into sales, right? Sales feels very much like it is not for women. And I'll tell you where a lot of that comes from. Sandy was talking at the beginning while we were waiting for you all to join us about what types of language suggests a particular role that has been rooted in gender base. So a lot of times we'll see sales roles and job descriptions that say, we're looking for a hunter. We're looking for somebody who's going to smash their quotas. And those things may feel very aggressive and they may feel very masculine. And so a lot of times women don't see themselves in those roles. So they'll move into something that's a little bit more like customer service focused or um, case management. And one of the things I will tell you is women are so good at sales. When they get into sales, they do extraordinarily well because they understand the value of relationships. So as you're starting a new relationship with a friend, let's think about it this way. You're never going to sit down and say, I want to be friends with you because <laughs> I heard you're a really good baker and you're going to bake me a bunch of cookies. And also you're good at sewing and I've got a lot of things that need to be darned. And also you would never do that, right? there's a really clear value exchange that goes into a new friendship. And so you may add value by texting them a funny picture, by inviting them to take a walk with you. And so the value exchange is really organic and relationship-based. Sales is the same way. So as you're starting to think about that, you wanna develop a relationship with somebody. So as you take on this little exercise that I've given to you, which is pay attention for the next two and a half days, how many times people say I, See how it makes you feel. See how, if it makes you defensive, it makes you feel like, well, this person's only concerned about them. And I'll tell you one of the best places you can look to find these is in your LinkedIn inbox. Oh my goodness gracious. I get so many messages in my LinkedIn inbox that say, hey Shannon, will you accept my connection? By the way, I sell a software that and launches into an immediate sales pitch. And I think, wait a minute, we don't even know each other yet we haven't started dating. You're trying to take me out to dinner. <laughs> you don't even know what kind of food I like yet. And so that's the type of thing that I'm talking about when I say, let's think about relationships. How can you build those relationships? So one of the things that you can do is say, okay, now the person I'm trying to prospect, and I'm saying prospect softly, because if you're in sales, you, you absolutely know what a prospect is. If you're in a different arena, but you wanna use these sales techniques because we're all in sales, the person you're prospecting is who you're trying to sell your idea to, right? So you want to think about value for them. Perhaps you send them an email and say, I read this article. There were three things in it that reminded me so much of you. I thought you'd enjoy it. There's no ask there. There's no request. The only I in there is I want to share something with you. I know that you live in Pittsburgh and I read something about a brand new restaurant there that I thought you might be interested in because you told me one time that you were starting to eat more vegan food. So one of the things that you really want to make sure that you can pay attention to is personalizing your relationship. So when we think about, for example, all of the emails that come your way, 
you can tell if somebody has done a spray and pray, right? They have just sent 500 emails out to everybody whose email address they could data mine. And there's nothing in there that makes you feel like, you know, they care about me. They might have something that would be really helpful to me. I want to engage in a relationship with them. But if they send you something that says, dear Doreen, I saw something that really reminded me of you. I can remember you telling me that you really enjoyed traveling. And I found this really cool 4D app that will let you feel like you're traveling even though you're still sitting on your couch. Well, that's gonna go over very well because they'll know we're building a relationship here. And the ultimate goal as a salesperson is to get to trusted advisor status. Now, you can't get to trusted advisor status if people can't trust you. If they think, ah, oh, their first message was they're trying to sell something because they've got a quota and their sales manager's breathing down their back, it's really hard to build a relationship that way. It's very challenging to build a relationship that way. So here's where I'm gonna ask you to jump into the Q&A box and tell me either a really good sales story where somebody built a very nice relationship with you and you felt like they were giving you some really trusted value or a really bad sales relationship where somebody jumped into selling and made you instantly sit on your haunches and say, no way in the world would I do business with this person. And while some of you are thinking of your stories, I will tell you, I took a call one time from a salesperson because I always take calls from salespeople because I love to hear what people's techniques are. And the guy I could tell was sort of panting. He was breathing really hard. And he was like, okay, 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 is this Shannon? And I said, it is. And he said, I'm calling because I have a piece of software that will just make your life so much better because it will be productive and you will be able to track all of the analytics and you'll be able to, and I thought, whoa, slow down. Um, what's your name? <laughs> and this guy was just obviously reading from a script and he had himself so hyped up and his fight or flight mechanism was so triggered that I was like, this guy needs a little bit of help, right? He needs a little bit of help. And so in this particular situation, I was watching this guy who was trying to follow his seller's journey, call the person, try to prospect them, try to qualify them. He didn't ask me a single question and dove right into his immediate um, chat from his sales scripts. So, all right, I see chat was, Chat is disabled, but you can definitely put some messages here in the Q&A. So if you've got a really good or really challenging sales experience that you've had, we'll throw it in there and we will discuss that. All right. So while we're waiting for any really good examples, and I can see, I recognize some of the names on here. So I know, <laughs> I know some of you have been involved in some interesting sales challenges. Uh, we have one here that says, I was buying a car, it's always buying a car. The salesperson focused on my husband and not me, even though my husband kept saying it was my decision. This is such, thank you so much for sharing because I can see some people nodding their heads already. Mm -hmm. That's right. So you remember, um, or maybe you've heard, um, there was a really great focus uh, that IBM introduced. It was called BANT, Budget authority, need, and timeline. And so you want to figure out who your actual buyer is, who has the budget, who's the authority, who's the need, and who's the timeline. And what's interesting about sales, particularly in business to consumer B2C sales, a lot of times the female householder is the one who's making the ultimate decision. And we will see salespeople who are so used to saying, okay, you know what, I'm this, it, here's the husband, I'm going to reach out to him. And I didn't see the end of your story, but I can almost bet that you did not buy the car from that salesperson because they weren't trying to build a relationship with you. They wanted to build the relationship with the person that they had already decided this is the one. Okay, we have another one. We tried to buy a mattress. We told the man what our budget was and exactly what we needed. He told us they did not have that, but they did have the perfect mattress that was 10 times the price. Finally, we broke away and asked to walk around. We found the perfect mattress. We were so frustrated that it was the one by his desk and he said they didn't have it, that we left and bought one somewhere else. Thank you so much, Amanda, for sharing that because I think this calls into what is a false relationship, right? 
So as you're building a relationship, even if it's something that's a little transactional, like a mattress, when somebody tells you something that either is verifiably untrue, or you can tell that they don't know the answer, but are afraid to say, I don't know it, it will immediately put your buyer um, haunches up. You will say, you know what? This is a false relationship and this is, this is a place I do not want to go. And so I think that example is a really good one. And thanks for sharing that, Amanda, because here you see somebody who has disrespected that relationship, right? Uh, we have another one. I've been in meetings as the boss and individuals around the table kept looking at my direct reports who were men as the leader on our team. Thank you for sharing this example because this is a great example of how we're trying to sell an idea. So here, the boss is not looking at this person, but instead looking at this person's direct reports who are men to say, okay, I'm going to skip right past you and I'm going to get the answers here. And my guess is that relationship fractured pretty quickly, right? Pretty quickly. And I want to thank you all for giving these examples because they're perfect. They're really good ones. But I bet for those of you that had bad ones, as you're typing it out, you're having a visceral reaction right now. Your palms are probably a little sweaty. Your heart's beating a little bit more. You might, you might actually have a little frown coming up on your forehead because a bad sales experience will give you that visceral reaction and it leaves such a poor taste in your mouth. And what's really challenging for those salespeople is you've probably told seven people that story. You've told seven people that story. And those seven people may have also related to somebody else. I mean, you just told it to us, so now we've all heard it as well. And so somebody who builds a good relationship, they're not going to get that same thing. Somebody else is going to go out and say, you know what? I worked with Amanda and she was so great. She was really focused on my needs. She asked me a lot of questions and she told me if she wasn't the one who could solve my problem, she'd help me find somebody who did. And that trust line, not only does it work very well with personal relationships, it works really, really well with work relationships when you're trying to sell yourself or an idea. We're gonna to move to the next slide because data is such a good way for you to take a shortcut to think about how you can continue to build those relationships using truth and trust. Okay, so I love this woman standing in front of this picture because she looks like she is doing research, right? She is looking for something and she's got all this data in her background. <laughs> so I love her. I love this picture. And what I want you to think of when you think of this picture later, when you're saying, okay, I've thought about all of my emails and I've looked at how many times people said I, and then on the other side, you're going to look at how many times you've said I. Now I want you to think about how can I use data and analytics in a way that can help me build trust more quickly? Because a lot of times when you're involved in trying to sell something, it may be when you're in that meeting and your boss is looking across you to your direct reports who are probably presenting the same idea as you are. How can you use data to pattern interrupt their thoughts and their emotional feelings so that you can help to build a case for what it is you're trying to sell? So if you're in sales, if you are a straight up salesperson, one of the things that you can use data to do is really improve your lead generation and your lead conversion. If you're applying for jobs, you can use data in this exact same way, right? So what we're talking about here is if you can look at the analytics that you have available to say, okay, now I can see what I'm up against here. If you're applying for a job on LinkedIn, it will tell you. 72 other people have also applied for this job, right? So how can you stand out in front of the rest of those people, right? So one of the things that you can think about is how can I gather the data that I need so that I can present something that makes really good sense and we can agree upon, right? Data is a perfect way to do that. So when you think about, and I'm sure you've all heard the saying, I wish I had said it first, but I did not. In God we trust all others bring data. Data is a great equalizer because you can say, you know, according to McKinsey research, seven out of 10 people who are in HR positions will be evalu evaluating a new HRIS system in the next three years. Are you one of those seven of 10 people? 
And they'll very quickly tell you, yes, we're going to be looking at a new HRIS system or no way. I just signed a contract six weeks ago. And so think about the ways that you can use the data to make sure that you can approach the person that you're trying to build this relationship with so that you can say, here are some irrefutable facts. This is some data that I've got. And then taking it a step further to say, how can I use the data that I already have to build a perfect best case scenario for me for when I'm trying to sell something here? So if you're trying to sell, again, 70 other people who want that exact same job on LinkedIn, what type of data can you take away from that? So if you are looking inside of LinkedIn and you can see, you know, 70 other people have applied to it, and many of them have the title of Associate Client Success Manager, and this is VP of Client Success, you know right away that data is gonna tell you you should bring out all and, and really showcase all of the information that you have that shows your leadership skills, that shows you know how to take a team that already exists and keep pushing them to greatness. So you wanna use that data to sort of shape the environment so that you can say, I get exactly where we are and I know how to use this data in a way that will help me to not only build relationships, but to also increase my chances of somebody accepting what it is I'm selling them. Again, whether it is an idea, a product or a service. The next thing you'll really wanna use data to do is to just sort of make sure that you're on matches, right? So when you're looking to say, okay, I understand what I'm trying to sell and I understand the person I'm trying to sell it to. The person you're trying to sell to is going to say, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? So if you're at the same level as they are, you may be able to say, hey, look, we know, we know exactly what your problems are. We know your challenges because we do the same role. And if not, you want to bring data that says, one of the things that I've learned is 67% of the people who are in VP and above positions don't have the time to get down to the bottom to understand how the technicians are doing their jobs. Do you want me to tell you what we know are some of the most common problems with technicians today? And then they're going to open themselves up to that. So whenever you can bring data into a conversation, when you can bring data into the situation, there's a really powerful way for you to, instead of trying to use this hard sell, this aggressive approach that says, I have something to buy and you must buy it. And here's why. You can use the data that will help them to make up their own mind in a value-based situation. That makes really good sense. I see we got a, another um, piece of information that says relationships are more important as the cost of the item raises. And that is so true. Thanks for bringing that up, Ralph. So when, when you've got something that is on the line, and we talked just a little bit about B2C, um, if you've got a B2B selling environment where you've got a really large or very long contracted process, the relationship does become even more important. And so you can kind of think about how your relationship moves from the transactional to something that is so powerful that you've been giving them data and value the whole entire time. So they come away from it feeling like, this person I like and I trust, we are going to do this thing together. So on the next slide, I want to give you three quick and easy ways that you can begin your presentation or your introduction to somebody, although we all live on Zoom right now, it's 2020, but three ways that you can present with power. And I put these pictures in here because if you're the type of person that is a really visual learner, take your mobile phone and sh take a little shot of this right now because these three things are super ways for you to begin a presentation so that you can grab somebody's attention from the very beginning. Again, if you're building a relationship, you want to make sure that they, in the first two minutes when they're psychologically deciding, do I like and trust this person enough to listen to them a little bit more, you can pull them in. All right, so the first one, you see the question mark is, start with a question. Would it surprise you to know that nine out of 10 salespeople are men? And then you pause, you have that sort of pregnant pause. You know, if you're giving a presentation um, to a group of people who you work with and you need them to understand your point of view, would it surprise you to know that six out of the seven people in the engineering department feel like they don't have the tools they need to do their job? And then you pause. And so when you lead with a question, it immediately pattern interrupts what the person that you're building the relationship 
has decided to think about you. So it's a good way for you to start a presentation or a conversation by using, again, the data that you've already dug up. The next one, which looks a little bit like the um, compass, is a storied invitation. So asking somebody to come along on a journey with you. So at the very beginning of this presentation, I said, imagine with me, if you will, that one year from now, you will be sitting a little bit taller, feeling a little bit more confident. And that was my way to pull you into this presentation. So you would say, I do want to imagine that. That is, that is positive. That, I want to accept that invitation. And so when you think about that, that sort of way that you can say to somebody, you know, come inside of this. This is a story that I want to tell you. And we all know how important storytelling is to marketing and sales. If you want to sell an idea, putting it in the form of a story is a way better way to get your message across than giving somebody just some ideas or facts that they cannot imagine, okay? So Amanda gave us the really good example of trying to buy a mattress. So if somebody comes to you and they say, imagine that you were buying a mattress and the salesperson did not tell you the truth about the mattress that you were interested in looking at because they wanted to upsell you one that was beyond the budget you had planned to spend and didn't suit your new needs. Once you paint that picture, that story, people do imagine themselves in there. They can feel themselves. They've been in that mattress store. They probably even know what it smells like. You're tickling their senses. And once you start to do that, taking all of the good value and data that you've dug up, you're gonna be able to build that relationship much faster because you've given them this storied invitation that allows them to step inside of the picture that you're developing, right? If you've ever read a book and then watched the movie and you've said, oh, the book was just so much better than the movie. Here's why. When you read the book, you imagine yourself in it. So there are pieces of yourself that you're just dripping along those chapters because you've felt those emotions before. And a book really invites you to come inside of that story. When you watch a movie, you're a dispassionate watcher. So you're sitting on the other side of it and you're watching something happen to somebody. And so that's the concept that I really want you to take away here, which is if you can paint the picture by using a story, you're going to be able to pull this person in, in, in a way that is going to be so much more powerful and helpful to you. And then the last one I want to give you is a statistic. So we talked about data and analytics and people love statistics. People love statistics. Statistics are a beautiful way to start out a presentation or a conversation that will pull somebody in. So you can say, you know, Dr. Saletti, did you know that seven out of 10 students never actually buy the textbook that they need for their class? Let me tell you why the textbook that we have, <laughs> and you go from there. So when you start with one of these three ways, right? Um, a, an interesting or challenging question, a storied invitation, or leading with a statistic, you're immediately going to pull in the person that you're trying to work with to build a relationship with and ask them, hey, come inside of here. And so now is your turn, if you could dive down into the Q&A box and give an example of how you could use either a question, a storied invitation, or a statistic to lead off a conversation with somebody. This could again be a prospecting conversation where you are trying to um, set somebody up to understand how to do business with you, or it could be where you're trying to sell your idea to a group of people. So I'll tell you one that I saw one time, and maybe you have been to a dinner exactly like this one. I was very young in my profession, and I got a beautiful invitation in the mail. And it said, Dear Shannon, your presence is requested at Dave and Buster's. Here is the menu. Um, afterwards, we're going to have some networking and it's going to be a really nice evening. And I was like, well, that sounds so nice. Thank you so much. I'm, re I'm really interested in doing some networking and this sounds like so much fun. And so I went to this meeting and uh, I found out that you know, with the dinner, there was a slight presentation. It was about life insurance. And I know that many of you have probably had the same experience. But they started out the presentation with a really arresting statistic that said, most of you in this room are between the ages of 25 and 30. Do you know 98% of people between the ages of 25 and 30 do not have a life insurance policy? 
everybody was sort of sitting around looking at each other like, well, who are the ones that are? Because that's something I've never thought about before. And that's a good way to arrest somebody's thought pattern so that you can move into a place to say, you know what? Here's how you should be thinking about what I'm about to tell you about. So you've kind of gotten yourself into their headspace. So let's see. We've got anybody who um, has a storied invitation. Another one that I really like, and I think, I think you can use this if you're giving a one-to-one -one presentation or if you're giving a one-to-many presentation, is if you give somebody a storied invitation, ask them to write it down. There's something that's very visceral that passes from your brain through to your fingertips when you write something down, even if you just write it as a note in your mobile phone, because now they're making a commitment. And once somebody starts making those micro commitments to you, you've really started to sell to them your idea. And so asking somebody when you've taken them on this storied invitation to write it down, or, you know, once you've given them that interesting, challenging statistic, asking them to raise their hand if they were surprised by that, or if it was something that was new information to them. Because as soon as they start engaging their body, their brain starts saying, oh, I trust this person, I see what they're trying to do, but I trust them because they're delivering interesting information to me that I never heard before. So great, cool. So one of the things that um, I really want you to think about when you leave here today, because a lot of times when you sit in webinars and you learn new things, you're so jazzed up to use them when you leave, is I want you to think about how you're going to take this information and you're immediately going to apply it starting today. So I want you to jot a quick note down to yourself right now. I'm going to lead you through it. It will be pretty painless. And if you feel like doing it on your phone, you can do that as well. The first thing is take note of how for the next two and a half days you're going to be paying attention to how many times people say I to you specifically in sales situations when they're sending you emails or messaging or marketing how many times I comes up versus whether it's personalized or it's something that's so specific about you and then reverse it and say how many times do I send out messages that are value messages to the people that I'm trying to reach that's the first thing I want you to do and write that down and make that commitment to yourself the second thing I want you to do is start to think about the way that you're developing your relationships. So what type of value are you exchanging? And one of the things we know about the market, where the marketers and the salespeople come, is there's going to be an exchange. It may be value for money. It might be a product. It might be a service. It may be, um, it may be a sort of in-kind exchange, but there's going to be a value exchange. So I want you to think about those relationships and start to pay attention to the way that you develop relationships and the way people are trying to develop relationships with you and which ones work. So that's your second assignment. And the third one is, I really want you to think about how you can use data to present with power. So how you can pull your audience in right away, because you know, your brain is always on the fight or flight mode. Your amygdala is ready to say, let's get out of here, girl. We gotta go. This is dangerous for us. And a lot of times when somebody starts to approach you and they've got that sort of like sales look in their eye, your amygdala is like, we better run as fast as we can. So that is a really rapid decision, right? Because if your response is gonna be flight, you have to get running. We've still got those caveman brains that say, we have to protect, we protect ourselves, we have to protect our young, we have to protect our money and our wallets. And if somebody's coming at you on the car lot and they're saying, all right, it's time for us to start talking about, let's talk about all the add-ons. And you're like, wait, I was fine with the base model. Start to pay attention to feeling that and how you can use that in a way that will help you to sell your ideas. So how can you ask questions that will, um, immediately get people to pattern interrupt that fight or flight so their amygdala doesn't win so you can pull them into the moment how you can present them a storied invitation so they can immediately start to imagine themselves in the situation where the outcome of what you're about to sell them is the one that they find themselves in and lastly how you can use statistics to help pull them in so those are the three things they're not too many I hope that they are going to be amazing for you. And I think we have a little bit of time for questions. And I have one already popping up here. What are some examples of good questions we can ask to disrupt that pattern? Awesome question. Okay, so um, 
I think a lot of times it depends on your situation, but let's say, for example, you're trying to sell something and you're trying to do pattern interruption. So the first thing somebody's usually going to say in a sales situation is, have you heard of this? Do you know how our product works? Have you ever engaged with somebody for this service? And so they're going to ask, they're going to ask that sort of question as a leading question. But when you say, tell me about a time when you, or would it surprise you to know, or people in your position, people who are VP of information systems, very often find themselves not doing the thing that they love the most, such as coding. Do you get any time for coding? So when you sort of say, all right, I'm gonna take this question, I'm gonna put myself in this situation so I can help interrupt the pattern they're expecting, which is for you to come selling straight away from the beginning, just like my daughter and every child you know, which is they just come running at you saying, ice cream, and you're like, wait a minute, ice cream was not on the table because your broccoli still is, okay? So start thinking about ways that you can appeal to really what their senses are before you start to sell your particular product idea or service. Now, Shannon, we are getting some additional questions in, and one of the things that um, I wanted to take a moment to talk about a little bit with you is uh, you mentioned earlier women in sales and that women tend to be very effective relationship builders and therefore can be very effective in sales but um, they don't always you know choose to enter sales so what do you think some of the obstacles are that women might encounter as they look at or consider moving into sales and how might they overcome some of those obstacles i love that question and we could talk about that one for the next six hours probably <laughs> you know i think there are there are some very physical challenges that women will run into which is if you're on a sales floor it very often will be very male so it will be filled with exactly what you expect you know people may be allowed they may be competing with each other they're yelling over each other um they may go to places after work together that you don't want to go to and i have found myself in many a sales meeting where i've said uh no that's not I don't want to go there. <laughs> so I think there is this sort of like very physical thing that feels like, all right, do I want to put myself on that sales floor or in that really competitive, hostile feeling environment? So that's one of the things I think that you should look at right away. So if you're looking at a sales position, you should look to see, you know, what does, what does equity feel like here? And what is the sales floor like? And the sales floor, of course, can be virtual. You know, is there a leaderboard where um, there is uh, like a horse race or is the language that's coming out of people's mouths uh, very gender influenced? So, you know, is everybody sort of talking about, you know, slaying their quota? You know, does it feel very aggressive like that? So evaluate, I think, that sales situation to say, is this a right arena for me? Is this one where I can really grow and sort of learn? And I will tell you my favorite shortcut for that is to ask the people that you're interviewing with, or if you're, if you're already in the company and maybe you're in a project management role and get pulled into sales a lot, you're starting to explore the idea, is to ask the people you'd be working with the last book they read and whether they'd recommend it. Because people who read books or listen to podcasts very often are lifelong learners and they're people who are usually open to learning new ways of doing things. And those generally are the uh, more gentle and um, learning focused sales floors. So that is one of, the, it's one of the ways that I like to figure out what's the sales floor going to be like, right? How aggressive is this going to be? And is it going to be a welcoming environment where I can really get to where I need to go in terms of retiring my quota and being successful and helping customers? That's a really great suggestion. That's something that, you know, not everyone would necessarily think of. So I think that's another great takeaway from today's session. You know, think about asking what the last book they read is. Yeah, good, good. Now, for those who are, you know, considering a sales career, so hopefully some of our listeners are, are thinking about that if they're not already working in sales. What are some of your top tips for helping to better prepare maybe for a transition into a professional selling career? 
Yes, Dr. Saletti, I would say everybody should think about getting into a sales career. The best sales people I can think of are women, um, all of them. Uh, you know, when I think about the people that I've been like, wow, that was a really amazing sales process, they were women. So I would say women, yes, run out there and figure out if sales is a great place for you to be because it probably is. So here are some of the suggestions I have for you. One, look for a stretch project. So if you're in finance, for example, and you're doing um, your focus on FP&A. So what you're saying is like, all right, we're trying to analyze what our what our process is going to look like. We want to see what types of budgets we have next year. Are we augmenting our staff? Are we deleting our staff? So if you're a person that's involved in that aspect of finance, one of the things you can do as a stretch project is, is go over and sit with the people in sales and revenue operations or marketing operations and say, let's talk a little bit about your planning. You know, what do your territories look like? What do your goals look like? How can we make sure that what you're doing on the sales side is going to cross over to finance? And then you can get really close to the people in sales and hear how they talk, what they're doing, what their day-to-day -day feels like. There are some challenges in sales, right? There's a lot of rejection in sales. So resilience and high levels of grit are two things that can't be undermined. But a good way to get next to it is to look for that stretch project so you can say, hey, as a project manager, I'm always the recipient of your opportunities. I'd like to get in a little bit earlier so I can see what the sales to service handoff is going to look like so that I can help to influence it on my side so we can make it better for the customer. And those sorts of ways are a good way for you to get inside of the sales floor at your organization to say, is this something that I really want to do without taking a big leap and moving over into it and then finding out it wasn't for you or you weren't prepared yet. And I think then on the student side, the idea of internships or cooperative learning programs give them that kind of experience where they get to test the waters and get some practical exposure to professional selling. Definitely, definitely. And uh, as you know, one of your students <laughs> is currently interning at my organization and he's, he's so well prepared and it's fun and interesting, I think, for all of us to hand off a sales playbook and say, try to break this. You know, what didn't I put in here that you need that would be really successful for you? So internships are a really beautiful, brilliant way to try this out and say, you know, do I like it? Uh, because it's such a powerful career that can take you in so many directions. Oh, definitely, definitely. And, you know, you mentioned resilience before, and I'm so glad that came up because that's oftentimes a concern that many who are considering selling and even some who are working in selling get concerned about is, yeah, there is this level of rejection. You know, you're going to hear a number of no's before you get to a yes. Uh, do you have some tips for those who are looking to build their own resilience and to, to be better prepared to overcome the inevitable rejection that results? Super great question because it is something that we have to constantly practice. Resilience is a practice. It's not like you're born with it and you're a resilient person or not. It's something you have to constantly practice. And so I think one of the things that works very well is to find your sort of mindfulness mantra to say, okay, Here's what I do whenever I have a large letdown or disappointment. And it can be as easy as to say, you know what, if I hadn't asked or I hadn't gotten to the sales situation, it would have been no anyway. So getting a no actually doesn't change. You know, I got out there and I tried it. And if you know that you have a 20% win rate, if you get four no's, you're that much closer to your one yes, right? or to have something that is your absolute go-to stress reliever. And this is just good for life in general, not just sales, but sales can be so high stakes. And it's good to say when something disappointing happens, I know immediately I say to everybody, I'll be back in five minutes and I go take a very brisk walk and I pay attention to the way that I'm breathing. So I think what's good is to have a coping mechanism so that you can say, this will be my go-to. I'm immediately going to switch my brain from, you know, the panic that I feel into something where I can comfort myself so that I can come back and then say, what can I learn from this? How can I understand what happened in the sales situation so I can turn it around and make it positive next time and use that data to help you increase that win rate from 20% to something higher. Yeah. Mindfulness is really important. And I think it's a, it's a great way to, to work on resilience. And it's also something in general in selling that can better prepare us to be successful. Uh, it's, it's important, you talked about relationships before, it's very important to be in that moment and be present because you know, we think faster than we speak. 
And it's so easy sometimes to be thinking ahead on what we want to say next or how we should properly respond rather than being in the moment and consciously listening and, and listening for understanding. You nailed it. Listening for understanding. If you can listen for understanding, you'll be the best salesperson you could ever be, right? Somebody who listens to understand understands how and if they can add value and if not, how they can help the person get on the right path to finding the value they need. Yeah. Satisfying a need or solving a problem. It's pretty key. <laughs> you've mentioned data throughout this presentation. And I love the way that you conceptualize this because it isn't just about raw numbers and statistics. You mentioned just a moment ago in terms of coping strategies that as someone recognizes the coping strategies that work for them, that's data that they can bring forward. So can you talk a little more about some of the maybe non-traditional ways that data might be extrapolated or then utilized? I love it. So I think a lot of times whenever you're looking to coach yourself or you're looking to coach other people in selling, you can use straight data to say, if we know we have five stages in our sales cycle and I can see, you know, Shannon has a hard time um, converting from stage three to stage four. Well, then, you know, right away, here's, here's a place where I can help to coach Shannon or I can coach myself. And so that is a way to say, okay, it's not just our sales process and it's not the four P's of marketing, which I think most people know, right? If you're looking at this product, place, price, promotion, it's easy to blame not winning a sale on that, but it's really important to dig one level deeper in the data to say, okay, but what's in here that I could fix or I could adjust or I can AB test to say, all right, maybe this is something that I should be thinking about. Uh, but when you're looking at that sort of soft skill data, because really one of the things we're seeing right now especially as many people are taking their businesses virtual, largely driven by the pandemic, is soft skills are more important now than they ever were. So taking those sort of life skills to say, okay, you know, where are the places where I'm working very well? If I connect with people really well, but I have a hard time, you know, moving them along what is my traditional sales path, what are the things that I can do to make sure I can get there? So you can use that data in all aspects of your life, right? You can say, I recognize that I am really good at learning new concepts between 8 and 10 a.m. and not very good. I'm really good at being entertained between 8 and 10 p.m. Using that sort of data so that you can get yourself to be the best well-oiled machine you can be is a good way to get ultimate productivity. What a great way to think about that. And that also for those who don't see themselves as data-minded helps them understand that you know, data is everywhere and that they can be effective at both capturing and then utilizing that data. Thank you. Now, from your vantage point as a successful business owner, someone who's worked in sales for many years and uh, who has also you know, additional marketing expertise, what do you think are some of the key trends driving sales and marketing that anyone interested in entering the field or in building their own sales and marketing skills should be aware of? That is the question that I think since March 13th, 2020 has been on everybody's mind. So there is a real drive to digitization, obviously, right? We've got children who are in kindergarten doing school online. And so I think a lot of people who um, say, I'm not very tech savvy or I'm not really a tech person, um, that's a great place for you to pattern interrupt yourself, right? If you, if you follow that process of keeping a rubber band around your wrist and pulling it whenever you have a thought that isn't the one you want to have, that's a great time to do it because we're all tech people. You're in a webinar right now. You probably have a smartphone that you know how to use really well. So thinking about how you can start to, you know, cross over and say like, I understand how to use technology. That's going to be really powerful for anybody who's in sales or marketing from now on forever and ever. Amen. Uh, I have a client who is a hundred year old manufacturer who up until November of last year was still taking paper orders. And once they digitize, they're like, wait a minute, there's, you know, we just did 10 years worth of what we should have been doing in the past, you know, 10 weeks. And now what it's done is allowed them to service their customer more, which is what they really love to do. So I think saying to yourself, how can I make sure that I am open and ready to learn new technology and sort of test my skills on marketing automation systems, CRM systems, and really be open to the idea of introducing technology into my life? 
is a great way to say, if I have eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours a day to work, how can I make sure most of those hours are focused on the things I want to do best, which is delight my customers. And a good way to do that is to get yourself really ready to use technology. That's such an important tip. And you're right, you know, it, it, this digitization isn't just affecting us as adults, it's affecting across generations, across the lifespan. It's, it's pretty amazing how things have, have shifted. Um, although we were already moving in this direction, we could probably argue that it's just exacerbated the shift. I would agree. I would completely agree. And I think we'll continue to see it. People aren't going to say, well, now that we're back in the office, <laughs> We're going to go back to the sneaker net. No, we've gotten used to the internet. There's so many things we like to do on here. Uh, just this week, I did a parent teacher conference online and I was like, well, this is great. I didn't have to drive to school and park and walk inside. So we're going to see, we're going to see digitization forever. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us today to talk about sales and the power of selling, reminding us that we are all in sales. This is such helpful information. And I want to turn it over to Sandy to talk about some things that we have coming up in our WIN programming. Had to unmute there for a minute, forgot. So, well, thank you very much, Shannon, for uh, joining us today and sharing your insights on the power of selling. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I had had been a women business owner and uh, I was one of those people that found myself in sales suddenly. So it was sort of a, a really enjoyable walk down memory lane for me, even though maybe I didn't know the terminology. Now I can sit there and say, Oh, that's what I was doing. That's great. So it, it was really real self reassuring to see that I was doing some things really accurately. So thank you for joining us. Um, Again, always thank our audience for joining us. Uh, a special thanks to everybody behind the scenes at Win Wednesdays that, you know, through technology and support, and, uh, and especially the Roland School of Business that makes this initiative continue to grow. We, Doreen and I, and everyone involved, really appreciate that opportunity. Our next uh, Win event is on Wednesday, November 18th. And we're going to talk about stress and how are you coping with stress. And joining us will be Christy Stuber. Uh, it should be a great event. And as always, you can register for this event or for all Win Wednesday events at our website, website um, acceleratingwin.org. Uh, a couple reminders. We are now accepting uh, proposals for the spring semester. So if you have a topic or you know someone has a topic that you think really embraces what WIN and WIN Wednesdays, um, our focus, our goal, our mission, please consider submitting a proposal. Uh, it's very easy to do. Uh, you can contact Doreen or I, you can contact us through our website, acceleratingwin.org, and we can give you details on what needs to be submitted for consideration in uh, being a presenter, um, seminar, speaker, or having a panel discussion next semester. So we really would like to hear from you if you have something that you want to share or know someone that um, could share a topic of interest to us. We have two save the dates. One is Monday, November 23rd. That is Thanksgiving week. And Win Wednesday is going to collaborate with uh, Taking the Hill Purposeful Leadership. And we are going to have a panel discussion on the topic of how the pandemic is impacting women. So it's really gonna be uh, an informative session. We have several uh, amazing individuals joining us to talk about the psychological, the social impact, um, in the workplace impact, employment, education. So a lot of things we can learn from that session. In long range is our second annual AWIN event, Accelerating Women in Industry. That will be Friday, March 5th. And that is um, during uh, International Women's Day. And we will have more information about that event forthcoming, but put it on your calendar now. And as on behalf of myself, Doreen, everyone involved with WIN, I'd like to leave you with the thought that you are not alone. And together, we can make a difference. So thank you, Shannon, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you so much.